Welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Kimberly Arcand and I'm a visualization scientist for NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. I would like to start off with a poll. So April is gonna take us into our first poll today. If you could be a space scientist, what would you most like to be? Would you like to be an astronomer, someone who studies the universe? Would you like to be an astronaut, someone who travels to space? Would you like to be a planetary geologist, someone who studies other planets, moons, rock formations, that sort of thing? Or would you like to be an aerospace engineer who's typically responsible for designing the spacecraft or operating vehicles on another planet, that sort of work? So why don't you go ahead and put your answers into the poll and we will give you a minute to put in your answers. It looks so far like most people want to be an astronaut. And I have to say that is very difficult. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was young. I can say it was not a good idea for me because I have like the weakest stomach. I can't even go on a tilt to whirl without wanting to lose my lunch. Um, but I still love the idea of dreaming, dreaming about being in the stars. So it's really lovely to see everybody else has such fun dreams too. I see astronomer, we've got some votes for pretty much everybody, uh, all these different kinds. And I should say there are lots and lots of other kinds of uh, careers and opportunities to work in the space industry. So these are four we just picked for our poll, but there are so many different things that you can be from food scientist to spacesuit designer to administrator to computer programmer and artists and many more types of things. So we're going to end the poll so you can see the final results, but it looks like the astronaut did indeed win the day. So thank you for participating in our first poll. Let me just close out of that window. At any point today, if you have questions, just a reminder to please put them in the chat. We have a lot of groups joining with us today, so I wanna make sure we have enough time to get through everybody's questions. So um, go ahead and put those in the chat at any time. Just a little background on me. I think I'm a, a decent, I, I guess, test case, if you will, for working in space science because my own path was absolutely not straight. I started out working in biology, looking at things through a microscope. Then I moved into computer science. And for me, it was that idea of combining the science and the computer science, which really made it helpful for studying things um, for a part of a NASA mission. And quite literally coding was like a key that unlocked things in the universe for me. And we'll be talking about coding here and there throughout today's conversation as well. But I'd like to sort of take us to 1999, uh, way, way back in the 90s when NASA's Chandra X Observatory was launched. NASA is an incredible agency to work for. It has many, many different kinds of missions. And one of its missions is the one that April and I work for, which is the Chandra X ray Observatory. And Chandra studies really hot energetic regions of our universe. It was a very technologically difficult piece of equipment to create that took decades in order to do. And now fast forward about almost 23 years, 24 years, and Chandra is still operating beautifully and is still the most advanced X-ray telescope that we've got. So launch was incredible. We're gonna listen to a special message from Colonel Eileen Collins. She was the person who actually led this space mission. And she was the first woman to command and pilot a NASA space shuttle mission. So here we go, I'm Eileen. I'm Eileen Collins, commander of space shuttle mission STS-93. I was also the first woman to command an American space mission. On July 23rd, 1999, my crew deployed the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We had trained specifically for this flight for over 16 months. My crew felt personally responsible for the successful launch and deployment of Chandra. We trained heavily in simulators. We did standalone simulators with our training team, and we also did joint integrated simulations. Leading up to the launch, my crew was very confident that we were totally trained and ready to go. We weren't nervous. We were just primarily focused on doing the best job that we could. That summer, we had two launch delays. The first one on July 20th, was due to a problem on the space shuttle. And then the second launch delay was two days later, and that was due to thunderstorms in the launch area. But we were happy to finally get the launch off on the third attempt, about the third time that the crew had uh, strapped in to the shuttle. People often ask me, what does it feel like to be in a space shuttle launch? It sounds like you're in a room that's on fire as you've got the boosters and the engines burning around you in what we call a controlled explosion. There's so much shaking in first stage when you're on the solid rocket boosters that if you try to write, 
you would not be able to read afterwards what you wrote. We had a successful launch and we were able to proceed with procedures to get Chandra on its way on flight day one. So looking back, it was a perfect deployment. Our crew watched the Chandra float away. We took our final photos and our final videos. As we watched Chandra float away, it seemed like it was almost like a sailboat on a calm sea. We knew that no one would ever see the Chandra again, but that we would still feel its presence as it continued to send its data and its information to Earth for many years to come. So that was Colonel Eileen Collins, a really awesome person to get to work with, talking about how we launched Chandra. So Chandra goes about a third of the way to the moon at its farthest point from Earth in a very highly elliptical orbit. So it goes around the Earth really far out, almost a third of the way to the moon, which is really incredible. It gives it a great view of our universe. And it's about the size of a school bus. It looks in this uh, video or animation like it's sort of covered in tinfoil. It's like a protective coating for it. And it spends a lot of its time looking at and capturing information for things like exploding stars, things like areas around black holes. Chandra has been called a black hole hunter because X-ray astronomy is very good at being able to study and find black holes things like colliding galaxies and so much more. So it's really important when we're talking about astronomy to be able to have all different kinds of light to study. So things from X-ray light and gamma ray light, those highest energy lights, all the way down to radio data. <laughs> Sorry. And everything in between. So infrared data, optical light, ultraviolet light, all of these different kinds of light that our universe can give off of. And having different kinds of telescopes that can study them all is very, very useful. So we are going to launch our next poll, if April wants to go ahead and bring that up, which is about the electromagnetic spectrum. What kind of light have you used or interacted with in your own life? There's infrared light, there's ultraviolet light, there's X-ray light, and of course there's visible light. So you're probably the most familiar with visible light or optical light, the kind of light that human eyes can detect. But you've probably also interacted with X-ray light if you've ever been to a dentist, say, and had to get an X-ray of your teeth to see if you have cavities. Or if you've ever gone to the emergency room because perhaps you sprained something and needed to check to see if you had a broken bone. Right? So doctors can use x-rays to be able to look down through your tissue, through your gums, for example, down to into the teeth to see if there are little holes there or down into your bones to be able to see if there are little cracks or fractures. Ultraviolet light you might also be familiar with if you've ever had to put sunscreen on your skin to protect yourself from that harsher radiation from our sun. Um, and infrared light you might have also interacted with if you've ever used a remote control to turn on a TV or to interact with a car. So we use different kinds of light every day, and all of those different kinds of light make up the electromagnetic spectrum. So it looks like we've got the most votes for visible light and ultraviolet light and x-rays are really close uh, second and thirds. So we can go ahead and end our poll and share it with everybody so everyone can see the results. And as usual, visible light wins the day. Uh, but I hope we all sort of take away today some of the extra kinds of light, other kinds of light that our universe has to offer uh, to think about and learn with. So let's go ahead and close that down and then keep going. Okay, so we're gonna look at one special kind of cosmic object in these different kinds of light and see how very unique it can look. So the first thing we're gonna look at is this spiral galaxy called M51. It's nicknamed the Whirlpool Galaxy because it looks like a whirlpool. It looks kind of like if you've ever seen a picture of a hurricane, for example. If we look at just that object, that galaxy, that beautiful spiral galaxy in X-ray light, which is really high energy material, we can see things like little bright sources of exploding stars, things like black holes, things like stars that are dancing together, and we can see this hot gas, which is colored purple. If we look at that same field of view in ultraviolet light, now we're seeing slightly less energetic light than our X-ray light, but we're seeing things like really hot young stars. And you can see the sort of curves of that 
um, spiral arms. If we look at it in optical light, now we're seeing things like the cooler gas and dust, these gas like rings, if you will, all of that beautiful spiral structure that make up the spiral arms. And then our final little section, the same field of view in infrared light. And now we're looking at that much cooler material um, that's all around those hot younger stars. So when you combine them into one image, you get to see what a really beautiful universe we have, right? And what all of those different kinds of light can offer. You can see those bright point-like sources from the x-rays. You can see the bright red bits of gas and dust that make up those spiral arms. You can see the sort of greenish glow of the optical light, and you can see the blue hotter light from the ultraviolet radiation. And when you push those all together, those bright white spots, that's where you're seeing all of the different kinds of light stacked on top of each other. So that's telling you that those areas are really busy, really sort of frenetic areas that are just packed with activity. So that's the benefit of being able to use different kinds of light. So I'm going to take you on a very short tour of some of my favorite sites to see in the entire universe from things like baby stars and stellar nurseries where stars are literally being born in these tall columns of gas and dust to things like younger star clusters where stars are hanging out together, kind of like teenagers do before they say go off to college or off to work and start spreading themselves out throughout their galaxy. We can look at stars that are mature, that are on their way to exploding because they're starting to run out of fuel. We can look at stars that are in pairs that are dancing together and sort of causing all of this really great nebulous or gaseous stuff to be emitted around them. We can look at stars that are like our sun in size, but that are much farther down their path of their life um, transition, if you will. And they're starting to puff off their outer layers and cause these really gorgeous nebulae structures called planetary nebulas. So this is what our sun might look like in say four or five billion years. So plenty of time from now. We can look at stars that have exploded their guts out all over the universe. Exploded stars are my favorite things, by the way, I'll be talking about them a lot. We can look at things like the center of our Milky Way galaxy. This is our home galaxy. And we as a planet live off on one of the spiral arms. But if we look to the center of our Milky Way, this is what we see in all different kinds of light. We can look at galaxies in all shapes and sizes, clusters of galaxies with these big envelopes of hot gas, and even clusters of galaxies that look like they're smiling back at us thanks to gravitational lensing. So being able to study the universe in all different kinds of light is really, really important because each of those different kinds of light, it's like a different kind of tool in your tool belt as an astronomer. So we are gonna launch our, I believe this is our third poll, uh, April, thank you so much for queuing that up. And this one is, which of the following types of light is not a part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we've talked about so far? Is it gamma rays? Is it burst rays? Is it x-rays or is it visible light? Which of those four are not part of the electromagnetic spectrum or those different kinds of light that we have talked about so far today? And so far we've got 100% saying, burst arrays and one, two or three people saying visible light. So go ahead and keep putting your answers in. And then April, I think we're pretty close to completion if you wanna end the poll and share the results for everyone to take a look at. And the correct answer was burst arrays. We have not talked about burst arrays because they're not a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So having again, all of these different kinds of light to be able to study with, it helps us learn all of these different new things about our universe, which I think is an important thing because we are all part of the universe. We live in the universe and it's usually pretty helpful to know what's going on around you. So the Chandra telescope has studied quite a bit in the 20 plus years that it's been working over 3 billion kilometers traveled, over 3,000 trips around Earth that it's taken. It's collected 25 trillion bytes of data and over 4 million lines of code have been written in order to operate Chandra, to collect the data from it, and then to study that data. So we are going to listen to a short movie from Sabina Hurley. This is just a little interview 
uh, that she did. She is the flight operations team program manager, and she's kind of responsible for the daily health and safety of Chandra. Here's what she has to say. They knew the science that they wanted to do, the technology to do it didn't actually exist. Countless engineers had to solve a whole host of problems to get Chandra on orbit. The mirrors on Chandra, those mirrors had to be smooth to the level of a couple of atoms. You're skipping photons, so they need to be atomically smooth, and they have to be really delicately aligned because you need all eight mirrors to be working together, right? And they are now focusing on an instrument, and the instrument chips are only four inches square. And you have to hit that four inch square every single time. And that's not actually good enough. That would just give you a blob. So to get the imaging you want, the resolution you want, you have to hit exactly the same spot on that four inch square every time. And the spot you have to hit is less than the diameter of a human hair, 10 meters away. Then you have to do this on Earth, but it's gonna operate in zero G. So you need to figure out how can I align these so that they'll be aligned on Earth for testing. But then when it's up in space, it has to stay aligned. You can't go up and fix it. So how do I build all the structure around it so that they stay aligned so precisely through all of that? So once you've done that, you have to make sure that you're controlling the temperature of those mirrors to within fractions of a degree. But you're in space. It's a harsh environment. The engineering and the level of testing and trying and retrying and testing to get just the mirrors right is absolutely mind blowing. So I love the way Sabina says that, but everything that she says essentially is in essence that it's really, really hard to build a spacecraft like Chandra, the size of a school bus that detects these X-rays from our universe that goes a third of the way to the moon that operates in that harsh environment of space. It's really hard to do those things, but what's cool about it is the amount of work that it took all of those scientists and engineers and technicians and administrators to do that work has actually led not only to some really awesome science, but also to some really cool things here on earth. For example, um, MRI machines at hospitals have been improved because of the technology from X-ray telescopes. Uh, mammogram technology has been improved. The way our pharmaceuticals, uh, drugs at the pharmacy are um, done quality control, right? That has improved because of X-ray telescopes. We can better monitor populations of sharks, uh, for example, in the ocean because of telescopes like Chandra. We can better understand where there might be weaknesses in metal on things like planes, for example, before a plane is rolled out of um, the factory, if you will. So there are all of these different places that X-ray technology has actually helped make things on Earth um, better as well, which I think is pretty neat. So I'm hoping to get, since we have a lot of folks today um, in our session, a lot of classes, I'd like to get to the Q&A sooner rather than later. So I'm gonna leave this tour for you to do on your own. If you're interested, this will take you through all of the different parts of the Chandra telescope. It's narrated by April, my colleague who's on the call today with us. And you can use a smartphone to do it. You can also just use a browser, but it teaches you about all of the different parts on Chandra from its solar panels, um, to how it operates in space. So I'm gonna go ahead and click out of that and instead take you all right to the Operations Control Center tour instead. I think this is a really fun tour because it shows you where we get to do the work essentially to keep Chandra up in space and to keep it uh, sort of healthy and safe. So I'm gonna launch the tour. In this virtual tour, we have just stepped off the elevator. This is in Massachusetts, for example. And we're gonna sort of walk down this little mini hallway from the entryway. This is one of our meeting rooms and turn around and you can see here on the wall, we actually have a banner for our telescope that was flown up in the space shuttle back in 1999. The astronauts took a picture in front of it. Um, they used it for their daily press talks and then they packed it back up and they took it down to earth and presented to us as a gift, which I thought was really cool. And in the corner is a tiny version of the spacecraft itself. This is about one tenth the size of the actual Chandra spacecraft. And when you're there at the control center, you can see that up close and personal. Um, and it's really cool to be able to understand how Chandra gets to work. On the wall over here, that's actually some of the blueprints that were developed in order to build Chandra. So I like having those little historic pieces as we're going through. 
the control center. We're going to go down this corridor now. On the left side, if you want to come back to the control center tour at any time, April will put these links in the chat for you to access on your own in case you miss something or would like to explore further. We're only going to do one main room, which is kind of the most exciting room, but there's other stuff to explore if you're interested. So on the wall, there's a little history about how Chander was built. It literally started as an idea in the 1960s. And that was when X-ray astronomy was just beginning as a field. So it was quite a bit of work to be able to get Chander up and running and launched by 1999. And you can learn about all the details of this craft there. But we're gonna go right into the main control room, which is over here. We're gonna pop in this main room and you can see this is sort of where the action happens. We've got all of these different banks of computers and that's where the various flight operators and controllers are sitting at any given time. I will say during the pandemic, this room was much more empty than it was pre-pandemic. But even though we had a pandemic situation going on, there were staff here at all time. Uh, proper health and safety protocols were followed so that both the technicians, the scientists and the spacecraft would be operating 24 seven. Um, as usual in a healthy and safe way. So on the left bank here, uh, this is where the main command controller sits. Um, he or she sits at this first control and they are the ones that are essentially inspecting every command that goes up to the spacecraft. They all start from this set of computers. And on the other side over here, doop, doop, there we go. This is the lead spacecraft engineers console. So this person is really responsible for any of the activities that the spacecraft is going to be going through, what its observing schedule is going to be like, what it's going to do essentially for its work day. Um, Chander, of course, operates 24 seven, so it never gets any time off, um, which sounds harsh, but I think it's really happy about its job in its own way. Every eight hours, Chandra talks to us through NASA's deep space network. And so every eight hours, all of the people here on the ground, they're uploading information through NASA's Deep Space Network, and then also getting a downlink of all of the information that Chander has captured during that eight hour window. So then we're gonna go up front to the next bank of computers. Whoops, I went too far. Let me go back, press the wrong button. Here we go, this one. So right here, we've got a different set of systems on the left versus the right side. Um, the left side is the spacecraft subsystem engineers, and this right side is the essentially the instrument folks. And then we're going to turn around up here and see this main bank of uh, computers and screens that they all get to work with each day. This holds really important information for the health and the safety of the spacecraft. So you can kind of think of it because Chandra goes about a third of the way to the moon. We can never visit Chandra in person. The only way we can talk to Chandra, the only way we can take Chandra to the doctor, the only way we can fix things or get information from Chandra is through code. So everything we do to operate Chandra is just through lines and lines of code. And we're going to talk about what kinds of coding languages, by the way, a little bit later. But you can see up here on the wall on this bank right here, there are all those little green boxes. If something is wrong with a part of the Chander spacecraft, one of those boxes would blink to red. And that would alert everybody in the room that there is some sort of anomaly is what it's called. There's something wrong with Chandra to be investigated. It could be a false alarm. It could just be a bad connection, but it has to be um, investigated and understood. And then below that, you can see these little radar dishes with little it's information. That is essentially the connection to NASA's deep space network. So that is how Chandra talks to us down here on Earth. NASA has a few different stations of these radar dishes um, in a few different locations worldwide, in Australia, in Spain, and in California. And at any given time, whatever Chandra's eight hour check-in is due, it'll talk to one of those um, dishes. And you can see where Chandra is in its relation to Earth on the far left panel. We get information on its temperature, information on its location, information on what it's observing. All of that is kept up on this screen right here. So this is kind of like the downtown area um, of being able to keep Chandra operating and running. We are just going to head over here to a window where you can see there's a little bit of artwork over here. 
uh, one of the Chandra engineers was able to draw a little mural on the window shades over here and they update that periodically just as a little fun bit to kind of keep things light. And I don't know if you can see what it says, but it said uh, essentially keep it up Chandra Ops, which has a double meaning for keeping Chandra up in space, which I think is really cute. So that's the main stuff that I did want to show you out here. You can keep going down any of these hallways and meeting spaces. The one last other area of interest that you might want to come back to if you're so inclined is down in this hallway right here. There is actually like a, a sleeping bunk, if you will, because Chander has to be operated 24 hours a day, even during times of inclement weather, if there's a blizzard or some other like a hurricane or anything like that. Um, there has to be a way for people to stay on site to be able to keep the spacecraft going perfectly. And so it's really important that they have a safe way to do that if it's too um, like harsh out to be able to get outside. So that room is really important as well. So this is just a review, as I mentioned, while I was talking about the control center, we have objects in space that we're looking at. That information from those objects has been traveling to Chandra over a long period of time. Chandra has been pointed at that thing to look at and it captures all that information. And then eventually that information is packaged up into the form of ones and zeros. It's like putting it into a suitcase, a digital suitcase and sending that digital suitcase down to earth through NASA's deep space network before eventually it makes its way to my laptop or maybe April's laptop, wherever we might happen to be. So all of that is to say that everything about this kind of space science that we do, it's all about data, all about those ones and zeros or that binary code that things are packaged up into um, on their way to work before we get to, to see it and essentially unpack it. So binary code, what is that? That's just a method of talking to machines, right? We use binary code to be able to talk to cell phones, to be able to work with computers, to be able to talk to things like smart refrigerators or smart toasters. Anything that's electronic um, can use binary code because essentially it's a system of ons and offs, um, just like a, a power switch, if you will. So binary code is really useful because it's a very simple way to talk between machines. and after we get that binary code, it's essentially unpacked from that suitcase. And then we start to do the real work on it. We create a table of information and that table logs the time, the location and the amount of energy of each of those photons, each of those packets of energy from the light that we observed that were captured while Chandra was looking at that object. And then we start making something with it. We might look at a plot or we might make an image. And this image up on my screen now is actually the very first image that we ever released from Chandra. It's an exploded star or what happens when a star that's much more massive than our sun starts to run out of its energy and it collapses in on itself and then explodes its guts out all over the universe. They're called supernova remnants and they're really awesome things to be able to study. And this is what the raw data looked like when we got that very first observation. So this object, which is called Cassiopeia A, it's about 10,000 light years away, where a light year is the distance that light travels in a year. So 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers gives you that estimate of how far away 10,000 light years happens to be. So this first image that we're looking at now was only about one hour of Chandra looking at that exploded star. But if we fast forward to today, Chandra has looked at that same exploded star for over 2 million seconds. So you can see how much more data that gives us to work with. And now we have this beautiful image of what this exploded star, this gut that just you know spewed its guts out all over the place and what it looks like. And we're able to color it. So if you've ever seen like a weather map on your phone or on the nightly news, and you might see that your map is colored by say precipitation amounts, right? How much rain we're getting today, like I'm getting here in New England. You might have red for like the areas that are gonna get four inches of rain. And you might have blue showing areas that are only gonna get say one inch of rain. So all of those different colors that a meteorologist might include on their map gives you some information. The same is the case here. 
And instead of brain, now we're talking about the different kinds of elements. We're talking about things like sulfur, things like iron, things like calcium, things like oxygen. And we've color coded each of those. So for example, in this image, we're looking at iron color coded as purple. And you can see where there are little chunks of iron in the guts of that exploded star. So this map really gives us information on how things are spread out through that debris field. So now we're gonna take another poll. I think this is maybe poll number four, if April wants to launch it, thank you, April. And in this case, we're looking at light years. So a light year measures what distance? Does it measure the distance between the sun and earth, the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy, the distance light travels in one year, or the distance around the sun? Go ahead and put in your answers while I take a quick sip of water and check the time. I'm talking a little more today than I usually do, so I apologize. I'll try to get through the next couple of slides and hand it over to April. And it looks like all the answers I think are about in, and most folks have said that the distance light travels in one year is the correct answer. April, if you wanna queue up the results and show everybody, that is indeed the correct answer. So this exploded star friend of ours that's up on the screen, Cassie BA, that's 10,000 light years away. A light year is the distance that light travels in a year or 10 trillion kilometers. So 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers, and that gives you how far away it is. So we're gonna head and close out that poll and keep going. So I'll just skirt through a few of these things quickly, but once we have this really great data of things like exploded stars, we can do all sorts of things with it. We can figure out which of the light is moving away from us and which of the light is moving towards us and create a 3D model. And there's a virtual tour of this whole object that you can do. April will pop that into the chat, for example, so you can look at that virtual tour at your own time. Um, that's with the Smithsonian, and they have a bunch of activities that you can do with your class along with that object as well. So feel free to check that out. You can also 3D print it, and we'll pop that URL in the chat as well, how to download those files so that you can download and 3D print out your very own exploded star and hold one in your hand. And I should tell you that this print on the screen is only about four inches across, but the object in real life is about 40 million billion times the surface area of our sun and planets. And you can toss in Pluto into that math, it doesn't really matter. So it's a very, very large object. And we can even take it and bring it into virtual reality. We can pop that URL into the chat as well. So you can look at that with your students at your leisure. And we can even do things like hear that information translated into sound. So this is what a sonification of this exploded star sounds like. And here is Dr. Belinda Wilkes kind of talking about why this stuff is really cool. We are on this tiny little planet next to a very ordinary star that's in the middle of its life in a fairly normal spiral galaxy in some corner of the universe. And the universe is huge and there are billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of galaxies and supermassive black holes. And yet we are sitting on this Earth and we're able to understand at least some of what we're seeing by just looking. And so here we go. I think we're at our last poll at this point, but we're gonna talk just really briefly about the different kinds of computing, um, computer coding languages that we've used with Chandra. And we're gonna take our final poll that asks, have you ever tried coding? So go ahead and fill that poll out. Um, but essentially to build Chandra, to operate it, and then to work on all of the Chandra data, we use a very big mixed bag of coding languages, Fortran, Perl, C, C++, Python, MATLAB, Java, Visual Basic, C Sharp, Unity Scripting, JavaScript. As you can see, a total grab bag. Some of those languages are really old because it was when Chandra was first being built. Some of those are newer because we're using them now to process our information in new ways, to create things like virtual reality, to do all kinds of processing. 
Um, and it looks like most everyone has tried coding. So that's really lovely. Um, I think I was surprised when I first started working in astronomy, how much coding is necessary to do the job, right? Like 95% of astronomers need to code for their job, which I think is pretty surprising. So we're gonna end the poll and share it so that you all can see the results. Thank you so much for doing the polls. I hope you enjoyed them. Um, and the last thing I'd like to do is just play one more video from Dr. Daniel Castro on how much we've learned from Chandra before we move on to April's segment and then finally hit the Q&A. So here we go. We didn't know that stars could emit X-rays, for example, on the way they do it. We didn't understand how stars blew up. We didn't understand black holes in nowhere close to as much detail as we do now. We don't understand the clusters of galaxies that make up the, you know, the web of space-time in the detail that we understand it now. Chandra represents a huge step forward in astronomy in general. So all of that is to say we've learned an awful lot about our universe, thanks to Chandra and other NASA missions as well. It's really important to be able to look at our universe in different kinds of light and then be strategic in how we process all that information that we get back. So I'm going to hand things over to April at this point. She's going to just lead you through a couple activities. We're going to do one hands-on activity, and then we'll start our Q&A. So we have all these different fun activities, and we won't have time for all of them, but here are a few that we really like. And a quick note to educators, if you participate in the Hour of Code, which I think maybe some of you do, you'll see that many of these fit nicely into that. So um, this one, for example, I believe tells you that. Yep, Hour of Code activity. Okay, so the first one we're highlighting is called Recoloring the Universe. This is the main site right here, and there are a series of video tutorials that are easy to follow. Um, I'll click on the star forming region here and show you one. And uh, the interface works similar to Scratch, if you're familiar with that online coding program. With our activity, you'll be able to use code to adjust the data from exploded stars and black holes. The next activity is uh, Tinkercad, and I actually am a 3D modeler, so I use programs like Tinkercad and others to um, create animations of the Chandra spacecraft and of supernovas exploding. And Tinkercad's a free 3 modeling, free 3D modeling program online, and um, this is here what the interface looks like. It's also an hour of code activity. We have some tutorials kind of show you, run you through some of the activities you can do on Tinkercad. And this one, for example, allows you to create the moon star system. And um, this is also kind of a scratch related program. It uses the coding blocks. And so it runs you through some coding and some 3D modeling. And you can even import real data. Next up is Reach Across the Stars. It's a free augmented reality app where you can explore stories of women in space science. There are a bunch of activities associated with this app and it's free. Um, for example, showing real data collected on the surface of Mars. There are short stories and longer stories journeys they're called to explore. And in these journeys, you can ask questions and listen to interviews and explore 360 degree virtual reality content. For instance, you can get behind the scenes look at the Mars 2020 rover with Christina Hernandez, an instrument engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Being an engineer to me was a game changer. It gives me a platform to speak about things that I'm passionate about, such as science but it also taught me how to be self-sufficient, how to think about complex problems and find simple solutions, and how to use my ability as a 
collaborator, as a leader, as a team player to help us answer some of scientists' most difficult questions. And I know I'm throwing these at you rather quickly and I will certainly put the links to all of these activities in. Uh, for those of you who are trying to um, decode the binary code that Kim flashed up there earlier, uh, I'm curious to know if you got anywhere. But anyway, um, what you see here is a chart that shows the English language alphabet characters corresponding to ones and zeros. And so I'm gonna keep this up for a minute and allow you to um, put your initials into the chat box. So I'll, I'll just leave it up while Kim starts to answer questions. For example, my initials are AJ for April Jubet. So my initials would read 01000001, 01001010. And a computer, of course, would know what that was immediately. Um, I believe I'm going to hand it back over to Kim now and she can answer all your questions. Thank you, April. That was great. So yes, please take all the time you need. If you'd like to put your initials in the chat in binary code, we would love to see them. Um, we are a little geeky, perhaps, but we think it's good fun. So there are a lot of fantastic questions in chat already, and I'm very excited to go ahead and start answering those. So um, I would definitely want to prioritize a few of the second and third graders questions. So if you want to pop those into the chat, I'm gonna to try to get to those and then make kind of work my way back. Um, and then April, if you wanna start at the top of the questions and see if you can start answering okay. some in case I don't get to them all, because we only have about 15 minutes left. So um, I'm gonna start with this question right here. What kind of light is the sun? Our sun actually emits all different kinds of light. So it emits ultraviolet light, which is why I have to wear sunscreen, for example, when I go out into the sun. It also emits the visible light, which is how we're seeing today, for example, during the day. It also emits infrared light, which is how we feel warmth from the sun. We feel the warmth with that infrared light. Um, but in addition, it also does things like X-ray light um, and cooler light as well. So if you wanna look up the Solar Dynamic Observatory, that's one of NASA's main observatories that studies the sun. And you can actually see how it images our sun in many different kinds of light. And it's really, really cool. Those images are, are beautiful. I would show them on my screen, but I wanna make sure I keep the binary code um, light up. Another question, I think this is from the younger group. What education do you need to become an astronomer? How long or an astronaut? Those are great questions too. Um, so I, for example, started working for NASA right after my four year degree at a university. So a bachelor's degree. And that is not atypical. Um, if you want to do like really specialized work as an astrophysicist, then you're going to need to keep going a little longer. Typically, astrophysicists need to have a PhD. Um, so that's about eight years of schooling Though we do have some astronomers with a master's degree as well. Um, astronauts come from all different fields. Some of the astronauts that I know have PhDs in chemistry. Um, some of them are geologists that study things like rocks and rock formation. Um, most all of the astronauts I know have PhDs in science, um, except for Colonel Eileen Collins. Um, she did her undergraduate work, I believe in, oh gosh, I think it was math and economics. And she went through um, to being an astronaut through the pilot route. So she was in the military and she learned how to fly back actually when, I think she was one of the first classes um, in her military school of women that were allowed to fly. Um, which is, I think, pretty incredible. Um, but they are really fantastic people to get to know. Lots of different skills to be an astronaut. Really, really interesting type of work. Um, let's see, how do you work at NASA? So I think it really just depends on the skill set. As I mentioned at the earliest part of the talk, it takes all different kinds of skills to run a space agency. There are people who specialize in food science. Um, there are people who specialize in art, for example. We work with artists to be able to illustrate things when we can't image them directly. We work with people who are designers to be able to design spacesuits. We have people who are specializing in administration. We have people who run the supercomputers. We have people who create and build things like exhibits. We have people who build things that can be driven on other planets. It's such an eclectic field. There are so many different things that you can do to work at NASA. 
So I, I hope that helps. Um, wow, there are so many questions. Okay. <laughs> so um, how do stars explode? I think I just saw. So stars um, are like people, they come in all different sizes. And the, the fate of a star depends on its mass. So the smallest and dimmest stars can live for a really, really long time. Like some of the smallest dimmest stars out there could last for, I don't know, like 50 billion years. That's billion with a B. That's a really long time. The universe has only been around for about 14 billion years with a B. So that tells you that being small and dim might sound boring, but it means you get like a bird's eye view of the universe for a really long time. Stars that are really massive, like many times more massive than our sun, they are so like tumultuous and energetic that they kind of live these short, fast and furious lives. So they use up so much energy that they can explode after they've only been around for like 50 million years, like that's with an M. So that's a lot less time than stars like our sun that are kind of average size. Uh, that can stick around for quite a bit. So we're, um, our average size sun that we have is about halfway through its life cycle. Um, it has perhaps about 5 billion years left in its lifetime. So um, stars explode because essentially they're really massive and they run out of fuel, their cores collapse in on themselves and then it sort of flicks off this massive explosion and they just explode their guts out all over the place. So I hope that helps. Um, and I hope that helps the next question about how long a star um, can last. Let's see, has Chandra seen uh, a planet uh, outside of our solar system? Um, yes, though not directly. So Chandra actually was credited recently with uh, finding the very first planet outside of our galaxy. Um, that's been sort of viewed with um, an X-ray telescope that had never been done before. It was very, very exciting. Um, it's actually in the Milky Way galaxy, I'm sorry, outside of the Milky Way galaxy in the M51 galaxy, which is that image that I showed earlier in the many different kinds of light. Um, and that was really exciting because that, that galaxy is pretty far away. So to be able to do that was very cool. And so Chandra can be used to study the like host stars of planets outside of our solar system. And we've done that for quite a few things, which I think is really cool. Um, how long does it take to, how long does it take the data to be received from Chandra of the area it's looking at? So, um, well, it really depends. So when an astronomer wants to figure out the answer to a question, it poses, a proposal to NASA to be able to study that object with Chandra for some amount of time. And it really depends on the object that they're looking at and what they're trying to find out. And they might propose to study, I don't know, some nearby star for say two hours, or they might propose to study a black hole for 20 days. There's a huge difference that they can ask for time on. And so depending on the panel of scientists and engineers that are looking at that proposal, they decide whether or not that person is gonna get the time or not. And if they get the time, then they're awarded it. And then it's a pretty fast turnaround. Chandra, as I mentioned, is downlinked every eight hours. So if Chandra looks at the object on a Tuesday um, in the afternoon sometime, by Wednesday morning, the information will be downlinked. It'll take a little bit to get over to the folks that are gonna check it out to make sure the data is good, to make sure all the information is, is cool. And then eventually they'll send it to the person that, that asked for the data. So it can take only say a couple days um, for everything to be checked out and for them to have it on their own laptops. So I hope that answers your question. Who named Chandra and why was this name selected? That is a great question as well. So Chandra was actually named from a contest that NASA held in 1998 slash 1999. And the winning entry came from a high school student as well as a high school science teacher. And they posed for the name Chandra, who was a famous astrophysicist whose full name was Chandra Sekhar, Subrabanyan Chandra Sekhar. He was an Indian American um, Nobel laureate who studied things like white dwarfs, which are really, really compact stars. Um, older stars, if you will. And so that name was selected because his work on that type of star was really important. And Chandra looks at that type of object and it was just a really, really fitting name. So I thought that was kind of neat that a high school student and a science teacher got to name one of NASA's great observatories. 
Um, all right, April, I just want to take a quick break because I've there's so many questions um, in the chat. Did I answer enough of the second grade and third grade students' questions? And did I miss any good ones that you think I should get back to? Uh, there's so many good ones. Um, somebody was asking about if, if Chandra would come back to Earth ever and how oh. we could fix mm -hmm. the mirrors if they were okay. broken and how far Chandra can see. Those are some that are kind of related. Okay. So Chandra can see like really far back in time, like pretty much back to, well, like 13.8 billion light years, I'd say. Um, it can see very early objects, not obviously as far back as what the James Webb Space Telescope is gonna see, which is our the newest space telescope that has just launched. Um, but Chandra has its own strengths and can look at really amazing things like matter swirling around a black hole just before it's gonna pass into the event horizon, which is the point of no return. So Chandra's viewing power is kind of like being able to read a stop sign like over 12 miles away, right? So, oh, I see someone has hungry students. I totally agree with that. So we will sign off. Thank you so much for joining, Chad. I hope we got to answer some of your questions. There were so many. Um, it was really nice to meet you all. Um, all right, anything else in that list that you gave me, April, that I missed? Um, will Chandra ever come back to Earth? Mm. Okay, so Chandra is essentially far enough away that it cannot be fixed physically. So when Chandra starts to degrade past the point of it being worth to be kept around, right? Like if all the instruments were to break, for example, or if a meteor were to like whack into it tomorrow, which I really hope does not happen because I love my job, um, we can't fix it really. There has been some discussion about being able to send up a robotic mission at some point to fix Chandra, but that is very theoretical and would probably be too expensive to do. But it's always a balance because right now Chandra is still the strongest, most powerful X-ray telescope that we have access to period on Earth. So that means if we don't have another X-ray telescope coming up anytime soon, it might be cost efficient to fix Chandra in order to keep it going because it is a really, really important resource for the astronomical community. So it's possible that we could somehow quote fix it from afar at some point. But if Chandra cannot be fixed, then yes, eventually its orbit can be lowered and it could essentially burn up um, in our atmosphere, but it will never be returned to Earth, for example, uh, like they had thought about doing with the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's, it's all a matter of we'll see what happens and where technology is at that time, but that's what we know right now. Um, okay, thank you so much, folks that are turning off. Very much appreciated. I can still do the last few minutes of questions if people have any questions left. Um, we've only got about five minutes and I'm not sure if some of the people have left to ask questions. So if you still have a question, please feel free to pop it in chat. Uh, all right, so it looks like there's another question. Since the sun is essentially a star, will it explode one day and leave us in darkness? That's a very poetic way to ask that question, Cynthia, thank you. So yes, the sun is a star. It's a really lovely star. It's very average sized and middle-aged of a star. And because of that, that means that it is not actually massive enough to explode. However, what it can do is turn into a planetary nebula. Um, so I can bring up a picture really quick. Let me see, here we go. Uh, so hopefully you can see my background. Um, but if you look at my background, for example, this is a planetary nebula. This is kind of like what our sun might look like in about five or so billion years after it starts puffing off its outer layers and creating these beautiful nebulous structures all around it. Planetary nebulas are kind of like snowflakes. They're all very unique looking. So I don't know exactly what the sun would look like but it will be this type of star to do this type of planetary nebula, which I think is really cool. Um, before we get to the planetary nebula stage with all that beautiful gas though, the sun will expand as a red giant. And we are not sure exactly how far that expansion will take it, but for sure it'll expand past Venus and it might get close enough to kind of approach touching earth. So at that point, it will be super bright still and too hot for us here on earth. So in about 5 billion years, we will have needed to vacate the premises and find somewhere else to live. But that's billion with a B. So I hope I don't give anybody nightmares. It's a really long time. So I don't think my, my answer was as poetic as your question, Cynthia, but I, I hope that helps. 
Um, and Rebecca asked what the furthest that Chandra's traveled. Well, the furthest that Chandra's traveled is that third of the way to the moon. That's the farthest point in its elliptical orbit. But what I can say is that the cool thing about astronomy is that every day we're time traveling. We're, we're constantly time traveling because everything that we're looking at in the universe is as it was. It's like we have a yearbook, but instead of seeing graduating seniors pictures, we're only able to see baby pictures. We're only able to see those seniors as they were when they were little kids, because it takes so long for that information to reach us here on earth. So if we were to like zoom out to one of these stars in a magical spacecraft that we don't have, or through a magical way of getting there that we don't have, um, everything would look completely different now because everything that we've looked at is traveling across time. So um, Chandra doesn't physically travel far, but scientifically it travels far because it can go millions and billions of light years away in order to capture things like black holes and some of those early forming galaxies. Um, so I think being able to travel 13.8 billion years is, is pretty darn cool. I hope that answers your question. Uh, and Rebecca asks, how long did it take to build Chandra? Um, it took uh, like a couple decades, I think 20, 23 years to be precise um, from the very start of that proposal to the actual launching of it. Um, and, you know, some of that time was making sure we had enough money to do things. And some of that time was developing the technologies that had to be created because Chandra was so special that we didn't have a bunch of those technologies um, before Chandra had to be built. Um, and let's see, there's still so many questions. Do I believe in aliens? I actually love aliens questions. Um, I don't believe in like little green men visiting earth kind of thing. However, statistically, when you think of how many planets there are outside our solar system that other missions that NASA have found already, we're past the 5,000 mark. And you think that number then extrapolates out to the fact that we believe most stars in our Milky Way galaxy have planets and most galaxies like the Milky Way would have billions upon billions of planets then there are billions and billions of galaxies. That number of potential planets gets so huge. So the possibility that life could exist on one of those planets seems high to me, but there are issues of space and time. The universe is physically really big and also big across time. So it's possible that some sort of civilization could have come and gone already, who knows? Um, it's also possible that we're early to the party. It's possible that things are too far away from us to ever really be aware that they're even out there, who knows? The possibilities are endless. Um, but it's really cool to think about. So it is two o'clock and I hope all of those um, answers are useful for you. And I hope especially the little kids that joined us today um, got to enjoy themselves. Thank you so much for the younger kids and the older kids that came to visit with us. We hope you enjoyed this session. Um, there will be one last session, I think next week, and then we'll be sort of closing it down for the spring semester, but we will be resuming in the fall um, if you would like to join us again. So very much appreciate your time. Um, thank you to the seventh grade classroom from Sarah, awesome. Thank you so much to everybody who popped the questions in the chat. There's some really very active uh, folks posting their questions, much appreciated. I hope you all enjoyed this and it was really nice being here. And April, thanks for helping out today. I really appreciate it as well. Bye all. <laughs>